you know, formally, I think the difference is like my brother and I've always done it with our own money. So like I don't mm -hmm. have the advantage of having, you know, a rich uncle who could say, hey, here's yes. millions of dollars, go buy this business or here's my business, you can run it. Um, <laughs> yeah. We basically had to find a business and then really buy it ourselves and find ways to pay for it, which in and of itself is a challenge. Uh, but Definitely. we were given our backgrounds. Yeah. I mean, thankfully, the finance education that both of us mm. got in New York, I think, has been very, very helpful in us being able to finance businesses that yeah. we ultimately bought. And we're a little bit different in that when we usually buy something, we actually like to run it. Okay. And so with this business, we bought it and eventually took over running it day to day and then really looked to use our other skill set of M&A and say, all right, if I can't grow fast enough organically, let me use my skills at buying other companies to combine with this business. Hi everyone, today I'm interviewing Matthew. He has the fastest growing Lifeline company in the US with over 600,000 customers. How crazy is that? He's basically a superpower as he is the founder and the CEO of Truconet, which is a company that provides affordable mobile products and services to low income Americans. How cool is that, right? Hi Matthew, how are you doing? Great, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. I'm really excited to interview you. I think what you achieved is absolutely amazing. Can you tell people a little bit about you? Where did you grow up, etc.? I grew up uh, in the United States, but as mm -hmm. I was mentioning before we started the show, mm -hmm. um, I had the good fortune of traveling around the world uh, when I was younger, living in numerous countries. Uh, so I got a little bit of a different education, both in terms of where I lived, where I went to school, but also uh, had the I guess the benefit of ultimately coming back to the States uh, in between those different trips as I grew up. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had a really, really interesting and diverse education living in countries like Thailand and Australia, which you mentioned, nice. uh, as well as Germany, Peru, uh, even Iran. I lived there for a little bit. So wow. I can say I'm an American who lived in Iran. That's a very unusual thing to be able to say. <laughs> um, but uh, I also had the benefit of coming back to the States in between those different sabbaticals uh, with my family and uh, grew up in Baltimore on the East Coast, of the United States, very close to Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. um, then lived in New York for about 10 years. And then I've been in California uh, really for the last 20. So uh, most people from California are not from California, and I'm one of them. But after 20 years, I, I basically say I'm from California. <laughs> That's awesome that you've traveled so much. What is your What is your favorite place that you've traveled to? Oh, Wow, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I recently took a trip to India with my wife, and I have to say that was amazing. And yeah. actually, part of my company is based in India. Okay. We can touch on that in a little bit, but it's yeah. uh, it's a it's a fascinating country because every part of it's so diverse and different. The north is completely different from the south, much mm -hmm. like the United States. So it's really really interesting. But I mean, I've been I've probably been about I'd say about sixty countries uh, during my lifetime. So there's a lot of different countries that are amazing it's hard to just pick one i pick india just because i was there very very recently and it's it really is fascinating I've, I've always wanted to go there i think the culture is amazing and i think you can learn a lot from going there that's for sure yeah the culture is amazing and yes. great people i mean really yes. really hard working really um technologically advanced and savvy mm. Mm. and we've had a lot of success uh really building part of our company in india how did that come about? What was your decision to do part of your company in India? Uh, it's, it's a great question. It's a long question. I think this gets to starting a business and trying to figure out the best way to run it. Um, when my brother and I originally started this business, uh, which really started from scratch, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, when you and I were talking before we started the show, um, it, it when we got into this business, we really didn't have any intention of getting into a wireless business. Mm -hmm. I apologize. You're going to get some sirens from Los Angeles in the background here. It's all good. Go around the corner. Um, <laughs> we basically started the company um, in about the 2006 time frame, and we were as individuals who've both been in finance. Our interest is both in financing companies, but also in starting businesses. And so we started a number of different businesses, several of which we currently still own. Uh, this company is the largest, and my brother and I have now decided to run the business as co-CEOs, but we're also the founders, the owners, and the and the individuals running the wow. business day to day. Um, as the business evolved over time and we had to change the way in which we were running it, 
Um, we really looked for ways to get more efficient. And one of the ways was um, really moving part of the operation to India. Um, as most people who are listening probably are very aware of, yeah. um, obviously the costs in India are lower um, in terms of human capital. So whether that's development or backend technology support or even customer service, you have many, many companies in the U.S. using India as a place to offshore. And, and it's a population that's extremely well-educated, mm -hmm. very hardworking. Um, generally, uh, it's very easy to find very, very good people. If I were to say this was a brilliant stroke of genius, <laughs> it wouldn't be uh, because we, in fact, when we moved part of our operation to India, mm -hmm. um, we made the decision being, uh, I guess, the personality types that, okay, if we're going to do this, let's own it. Mm -hmm. And so we actually built the whole operation in India ourselves. And so unlike most companies say, oh, there's plenty of companies out there you can outsource with who know how to do this. Mm -hmm. And really, that's all they do. Yeah. Uh, we opted to actually say, well, let's go there. Let's build our own facility. Let's hire mm -hmm. all our own people. And so we did that. And in retrospect, yes. that was completely insane. <laughs> and I wouldn't recommend anyone listening to do that. <laughs> uh, but it's actually in the long run, um, we've gotten very, very loyal employees who realize that we've now been there for uh, five, six years who wow. have seen us build a business over time and get bigger and bigger and bigger and they've grown with us and so I think we've really built kind of a core group of people who are technically our employees they are not an outsourced group so True Connect Solutions is a company in Pune India that is a separate company owned by me and my brother um, that has over 100 employees that oh. supports our business in the United States yeah. so I know that wasn't the main point of this no no that's a good answer but it's an that's interesting evolution of yeah i think it, it's a nice marriage of the things that my brother and i enjoy in terms of our yes. international traveling combined with um our own business in the u.s and being able to kind of combine the two has been nice so it's given me the opportunity to travel to india mm -hmm. i basically go about twice a year so um and i really do enjoy it because the people are great the food's great the culture yeah. is great yeah. and you know, we've been very very successful there with that business yes and now it's kind of morphed into its own its own business where mm -hmm. we are slowly beginning to start actually sell the selling services of that operation to other companies yes so i know that wasn't the point of that question no but that's a good kind of answer of it. Yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated by businesses doing that because i've interviewed people in the past and not just interviews but spoken to people and generally the the, the go-to is china or you know so right. that you've gone to india is, is pretty yeah. cool i like that concept obviously it's a, a technology advance did somebody recommend you to go in, to india or how did that actual <laughs> you know decision the actual come comment about? was like why are you doing this yourselves that's stupid <laughs> and in retrospect i mean kenley it was not very smart yeah. Uh, because there's so many companies out there that are called PPOs, mm -hmm. these business process outsource companies that you can hire to do everything from customer service to accounting, to billing, to what have you. And we made the selection to do it ourselves. I think my brother and I are the type that like to control how things are done and how they're implemented. Yeah. And so we made the rather, I think, uh, you know, at times I think it was a mistake because we had a lot of problems to yes. begin. So don't get me, yes. I'm not going to lie to you and say it was smooth because <laughs> no, it wasn't. Never is. Um, yeah. But over time it got smoother and smoother. And I was, we were very fortunate to hire some very good people in the U S and in India to run it. Yes. And so one of the people who works for me here in, in LA runs the operation in India and she's, she does a fantastic job doing that. Mm -hmm. And you know, now it's actually a profit center for us. So, which is amazing because yes. it was, a significant part of our cost and yes. now it more than pays for itself which is great that's awesome i'm very yeah. intrigued by this so now matthew you and your brother obviously sounds like you are very switched on entrepreneurs considering you're running several businesses have you always been entrepreneurs is this something that just suddenly uh, happened as children growing up yeah, that's a good question i've ever been asked that question <laughs> I, I think everyone i think i think what i learned uh, actually this is i think the the right answer is I learned late that I hate working for other people. So I don't know who's going to listen to that and be like, I hate working yep. for my boss. But that was, it took me 10 years to figure out I was an entrepreneur. I think there's, I read these articles about these kids who, who know they're entrepreneurs when they're 12 or 14 or 17 or whatever, 
fact, I read a great article about the uh, the individual who started the uh, uh, LIDAR uh, last week. I'm forgetting his name, which, you know, it's kind of embarrassing. But uh, just reading the article, he's 17, is at Stanford, he drops out and he starts LIDAR, and now he's a billionaire. And, you know, you read those stories, and maybe he should be on this. Uh, yeah. You read those stories like, wow, like, I wish I knew at 17, I wanted to be a billionaire. Um, but he... Those types of stories, I think, are amazing. For me, it was more uh, a late life evolution. Almost, mm -hmm. I spent ten years working for corporate America. I worked for, you know, very large investment banks in the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked for a really large Fortune 500 company for a short period of time. And uniformly, the one thing I learned is I hated all of them. <laughs> I just hated the idea that you had to be locked into a process of living your life waiting for the next promotion mm -hmm. and for me i don't know something in my dna i had to fight against that mm -hmm. uh so when i left my job in new york working at Russian bank i actually went to a startup before i started my own business and then my brother and i started several others um i made a decision to walk away from a lot of money i just said i yeah. can't do this anymore because i hate it and if i keep doing this you get to a point particularly in, in that industry where you almost make too much money to walk away from it because it's hard to walk away from that much money and say, okay, I'm, I'm always going to make this much money, even if I don't show up for work. So why not just keep doing this, even mm -hmm. though I'm miserable. And I think you'll find a lot of yeah. people in New York are like that. They, they've got these very high paying jobs that they hate and they just want to keep doing that because they feel like they can't leave. Yes. And so before that happened to me, I said, I'm going to walk away from all this money <laughs> and make no money and work for a company at the time that actually ran out of money. And we all, we all went on deferred salaries for nine months. And, you know, I, at that point, I think I just gotten married and was having a kid and basically had a job with no income. Wow. And it sucked. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was awful. But, you know, I think with every entrepreneur who's been out there, they've at some point, I think you learn more when you make no money than when you're making a lot of money because you think, oh, well, now I'm successful. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think when you're making no money, you really learn like, all right, like, do I have, you know, the perseverance to be able to put up with this for a long period of time for the greater good of the business? Like, I, I believe in this enough that I'm willing to make no money for some period of time. And nine months was way longer than I thought it was going to be. Um, and it was very, very painful. This is actually, I'm going to date myself here. I'm not a young entrepreneur. Um, I dated myself because I, that was actually the, the dot-com bust. This was 2001, 2002 timeframe. Wow. And that, that was really painful because making no money and then the, the entire bubble popped and then raising money for that. What well, was very, a very early stage company was yes. incredibly difficult. Yes. Uh, but it was a great experience looking back on it, for sure. And you know what? You don't actually grow. And I mean, obviously, you know this. You don't grow as a person if you don't have those struggles. In, if you're in your comfort zone, you're never going right. to you're never going to succeed because you're just going to be so comfortable. You're not going to get out of the the norm of what people do. Yeah, what was true. what was your experience? when you started getting successful, what was your experience with your businesses? I'm going to say businesses because it sounds like you guys had, yeah. had your hands in lots of pies. I mean, yeah, we, <laughs> we still, I think, I think for, uh, there's some entrepreneurs that just have that one idea that like gets them excited. Yes. And there's like, and I, I think that's what's good about some of these shows because then people kind of learn it yes. doesn't have to be one thing. I mean, it can't just be like, you know, True. like the inventor of LIDAR. Like I, I want to do, you know, digital imaging technology for, self-driving cars that's my calling and you now i'm going to spend the next 20 years of my life just doing that and that's amazing when you have that kind of calling but there's other individuals like myself where it's more you just enjoy the process of building something regardless of what it is and so i didn't have a mission to do wireless mobile phones it's just something that happened to occur my brother and i are both from finance backgrounds so we acquired one business. We then built that business up. We then acquired another, then we bought another, then we bought another. We put them all together. We restructured it. We changed the name. We changed the focus. So it became an evolution of a business. And from that sprang a business in India, from that sprang a business in China, nice. from that sprang a business um, 
that actually was servicing a, a Walmart in the United States. So nice. different businesses came out of it. Yeah. And even from that, in the beginning, my brother and I had two or three other businesses we had started separately just because we had an interest. Um, one was a finance and investment bank that is now a global investment bank called Trake Star Partners based out of New York that has over 100 uh, partners, 100 uh, financial uh, employees across the U.S. with eight offices wow. globally uh, is doing incredibly well. I sit on the board of that company, and that just came out of one of the businesses my brother and I were involved in. Um, so I think we're more of the, and there are entrepreneurs I think out there like this, which are yeah. more more fascinated with the process of building something than really what is it that I'm building. Yes, if that makes sense. Oh yeah, definitely. I completely agree with you on that. That, um, that sounded very logical. I've never said it that way before, so I'm like, <laughs> wow, it actually sounded pretty good. But that, that basically is what it boils down to. Is I'm not really good at figuring anything out. I just like building stuff. So. I find something that's kind of broken and then I start building it and go from there. So you've got the engineering mind. You like to yeah, I do think the it's process. kind of a little bit of the, yeah, you know, some people are inventors, other people are fixers. I think I'm probably more in the fixer box. Yeah. Did you like to play Lego as a kid? Did I? That's a good question. I don't know if I did. <laughs> um, I think, again, I mean, my brother and I, my brother and I got in a lot of trouble growing up, which I think that's part of <laughs> what creates that. <laughs> that kind of natural tension of test boundaries we yeah i could describe some crazy things we did as kids which you know my parents might let us get away with but we were very unruly so i think maybe that kind of fosters that desire to challenge boundaries yeah well, yeah. that is a perfect thing to do as an entrepreneur, because if you don't challenge those boundaries, you're not going to grow. So yeah, no, that's very, very true. Cool. So how did, how did um, your company come about? True Connect? How did, uh, how did yeah, well, the... yeah, True Connect came about, and I kind of alluded to it a little bit before it came up with, yeah. we had had um, a company that we saw that was in Southern California. And my brother and I went to startups, as I mentioned, and starved and raised money and ultimately sold those companies separately yeah and he's my twin brother so our identical twin brothers and we uh at that point in time we're, we're in our 30s and just said why don't we do something together and so we started a group uh really to finance and or maybe buy companies and kind of explore that as basically start a startup company to look at other companies that okay. were effectively either early stage or later stage businesses and we found a company uh that was a telecommunications company that was not particularly well run. It looked like an interesting opportunity. We were mm -hmm. helping the management team focus the business and getting uh, really paid as a financial advisor. Yeah. Um, and as we looked at it, we just sold each other, why don't we buy this company? Because we thought it was interesting and not really well run. Yes. And so we, we just said, hell, let's buy it. And so we put our own money in and we brought a partner in. Uh, we bought out the owner and we really then set about kind of refocusing the business mm. and getting it uh, more profitable. Yeah. And so unlike, and I've started businesses from scratch with zero revenue and I've acquired businesses a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much uniformly, I think the difference is like my brother and I've always done it with our own money. So like I don't mm -hmm. have the advantage of having, you know, a rich uncle who could say, hey, here's yes. millions of dollars, go buy this business or here's my business, you can run it. Um, <laughs> yeah. We basically had to find a business and then really buy it ourselves and find ways to pay for it, which in and of itself is a challenge. Uh, but Definitely. we were given our backgrounds. Yeah. I mean, thankfully, the finance education that both of us mm. got in New York, I think, has been very, very helpful in us being able to finance businesses that yeah. we ultimately bought. And we're a little bit different in that when we usually buy something, we actually like to run it. Okay. And so with this business, we bought it. And eventually took over running it day to day and then really looked to use our other skill set of m a and say all right if i can't grow fast enough organically let me use my skills at buying other companies to combine with this business and then use financial engineering it sounds fancy but it's really not it's just yeah. let me use my balance sheet and get a bank to come in and maybe give us some debt to buy another company and we did that two or three times with True Connect to get it to the size it is today. And that's really when we took the business and mm -hmm. um, for a 2013, 14 timeframe, we'd, we'd merged with three or four businesses where we moved part of the business from Dallas 
-hmm. to LA and then we moved part of it to India. Yeah. And so we started the India operation. We built out the LA operation. And then recently we've been building a smaller China operation with a separate company there. Um, but it really became an evolution of, of how we knew how to grow the business yes. and how to really speed growth because we're both super impatient and we want to grow fast. And I mean, some businesses, a, a software business or a, a tech enabled business online, they, they just naturally have an ability to grow faster. Yes. This is, I mean, frankly, this is a, a kind of a boring old school business <laughs> that really needs some financial engineering <laughs> to get bigger, faster. So it really was our, our only way to grow quickly was by doing that. And that's what we've done. And um, our, our focus now is how do we, now we've gotten to this size, how do we really grow it organically as, as quickly as we can? To the next size. Yeah. Um, what was your decision to have, because obviously you're very specific on your avatar here, who you're serving in this business, which is low income Americans. How did that mm -hmm. come about? <laughs> I can't, I think this is another situation <laughs> where like, it just kind of happened. It's the yeah. first business we acquired was yes. focused on that market. And, um, you know, my brother and I both worked and lived in Mexico and we've done a lot of things in, in that part of the world. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of the attraction of this business was it was predominantly focused on lower income Hispanics living in the United States. And so I think that that marriage of, of things made it made the business interesting to us because like, oh, well, it has a cross border component to it. It's yeah. There's an ability to serve that community that that we have some experience working with. My brother is totally fluent in Spanish. Nice. My Spanish is not not as good as his, okay. uh, but it's passable. <laughs> um, so you know that I think led to our interest in buying the business, mm -hmm. and then really focused us on how do we really expand what is an amazing service to a community that desperately needs it. I think COVID nineteen more than anything, particularly in the United States. I'm not, yeah. I don't know enough about New Zealand's infrastructure to, uh, <laughs> to make a comparison. <laughs> but I can tell you the, the infrastructure in the United States for communications for lower income is awful. Yeah. I mean, it is bad. And it was to, to feel like you are building a business, but also you know, doing something that's contributing and really helping people um, is I think something fortunate that's come out of this business where yeah. you know, we're not just you know, and again, not anything against any of the large tech companies out there that are, that are online or social media company where it's just more consumers, more consumers, more consumers, make more money, make more money. Yeah. Um, we we're able to provide a needed service, to, you know, try to earn a profit doing it versus how much yes. service we're providing. It's not always easy, but I think the fact that we're providing a service that's, you know, particularly during COVID-19 has become you know, just desperately apparent in the United States because yes. you have examples of kids, um, you know, kids who are doing, you know, their homework at a Taco Bell. You have, you know, kids who have, or people who aren't able to do telemedicine because they don't have a phone yeah. uh, and things like that. So as entrepreneurs, we can learn so much from successful people, their habits, their routine, their structure, their blueprints, the things that actually made them fail or lead to failure, the things that have made them successful. It's like having an online mentor. And one of my most favorite things in my business is to speak to these successful entrepreneurs because I myself have learned so much from them. I want to encourage you to please subscribe to this channel and hit the bell notification for more videos like this in future. Also share these videos with other entrepreneurs that can benefit out of the messaging and the literally the training that comes from these successful entrepreneurs. I will see you in the next part of this video. And servicing people like that is really amazing. It must be very fulfilling, right? To know that you're actually doing something really amazing in the world. Well, it's, it's funny. Sometimes I don't really think about it, to be honest. And I don't say that just because I'm focused on other things. Just, I get so busy running the business. And when I'll interview, like I've been doing interviewing different executives to maybe bring into the business, they'll comment to me like, oh, well, what I think it's great about this business is yeah. not only if you guys have been successful and you're growing, but like you're actually doing something that's like really positive and you're really doing something to really help people uh, and that a service that's so critical, particularly with COVID-19 um, in the United States and then perhaps you've seen these stories uh, from the U.S. where there's pictures of kids doing their homework at a Taco Bell or another fast food restaurant because they don't have an internet connection at home or they're borrowing their friend's phone to do homework or 
you know, someone can't do a telemedicine visit because they don't have any connection. And to be able to solve that problem, you know, for this community, which really is in desperate need of that, and if you've looked at the COVID-19 statistics in the US, it is the majority of the people who have had poor outcomes have been lower income. I mean, they're the direct line to your health outcome and you being poor. Yes. That's probably is an obvious thing to say, but in the US, yes, COVID-19 has proven that. Yes. And this is a real solution. When I talk to legislators in California or in DC, I often get frustrated because I'm like, here you have this service called Lifeline in the United States that offers a service to lower income for free, which gives you, uh, in some cases, a free cell phone mm -hmm. and free service. And you are solving the communication issue with education. You're solving the emergency communication issue with COVID-19. You're solving the ability to telemedicine visits through your phone so you're not going into a hospital. You're hitting all those and probably more I've yeah. forgotten about. All at once, this is a, an incredible solution. And, you know, leave it to politicians in the United States to not totally put those two things together. No matter how many times I tell them, like, you've got a great solution, just put more money into it. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, they finally have, I think, with the change of administration, we're very enthusiastic about what we can do now with um, the new administration and their focus on uh, really pushing broadband out to everyone in the U.S., uh, particularly those who are not as economically fortunate. Yes. And so. you would think that because, you know, especially with United States, because it's so big, and you would just think that internet is easy there, yeah. right? Because it's yeah. not like third world countries, like, because I'm originally from South Africa. We just experienced third, that that's true. Exactly, because this is like our second take, because the other one failed a little bit. But the the problem with third world countries is that it's internet is extremely expensive and it's not easily you know like it's to to get somebody to come to your house and install the connection and give you the modem or whatever you need to do it's a really expensive thing where in america and i mean you here we live in new zealand it's affordable but yet not affordable enough for low income people yeah. right right is that is that something that you guys then want to roll out you know like well, well, what's interesting, actually, you make a great point, is is I think this model is a great model for other countries to copy. I mean, I, I'm i intrigued by the fact that, maybe more mystified than intrigued, but I don't understand why other countries don't have the same program, especially now. I mean, you've got, I'm sure there's programs in New Zealand for people who can't afford their heating bill or people who are having other issues where there's subsidies to support that. For some reason... I mean, the cell phone and smartphones have become a utility now. You can't live without one. You can't find a job. Exactly. You can't, you know, do a telemedicine visit. You can't, you know, communicate with friends. It's, it's almost impossible to survive without one. And the idea that there aren't, you know, social support systems to support that globally yeah. doesn't make sense because everyone needs a smartphone today. It's just a, a reality. And you can use it to be smart with because you can, I mean, you can listen to podcasts and you can watch educational things. You can subscribe to educational platforms and well, there you go. There's, there's so much that you can learn from you. I, if I look at my phone, because I actually have an app on it to monitor what I do, you know, to keep me productive. And a lot of the things that I do on my phone is pure education. You know, it's, and I spend at least two hours a day reading things and watching videos on a specific topic that I'm interested in, et cetera. So it's actually very amazing what you guys are doing. And thank you for doing that, Matthew. I think it's, and I really, so do you guys have plans to roll this out more, like internationally in the next few years? Do you have any goals there? Yeah, I think our, our goals right now is to continue to grow in the U.S. I mean, if, yeah. if there's another program like this in the U.K. or Europe or or other parts of the world, then we'd love yeah. to roll a similar program out globally. Yeah. Um, think once we get a certain size, I think those opportunities uh, may avail themselves. Right now, we're actually yeah. doing um, more business in Mexico and Central America okay. as we expand in that direction. Um, obviously, the poverty issues there are acute, as uh, as I know you know. Yeah. And so there are programs there that aren't state-sponsored necessarily, but are subsidized in different ways. It's, it's probably too complicated to get into. But it, it is it allows us to kind of start looking at opportunities in that part of the world to kind of expand what we're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but everything that we're doing can easily be ported because all of our customers support the phones that we're making in China 
the other things we're doing, I mean, that can go anywhere. I mean, I can take that support structure. I can go to, you know, India, I can go to Europe, I can go to wherever, um, provide this opportunity. Currently, our big focus right now is expanding in the U.S. because it's a huge market. Um, we're only at 700,000 subs now. I mean, we could easily grow another couple million and we'd just be scratching the surface in the United States. Um, so that's our current focus. I think long term, we'd love to find the right partner to maybe come in and buy us that is an international player that could take some of these services and take them more globally. Uh, but right now, it's just focusing on the U.S. because there's a huge unaddressed market. I think Big market. by most statistics, it's like 60 million people in the U.S. live below the poverty line which I think most people outside of the U.S. don't realize. No. It's a huge population that is poor wow. and needs services like this. That is incredible that this, in a bad way, incredible that there's so many people living, you know, with that poverty line. Yeah. And it's quite sad. Yeah, yeah, it's sad. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I think it's the income disparities that you'll hear about so much. And in the United States, we love to talk about wealth and success and this is the richest company, country in the world, and we're the best country in the world. Maybe a little less so with the current administration. <laughs> um, but, you know, based on that, it's, it's, I think people fail to realize that there's a huge part of the country that is really living in poverty day to day. Um, you know, issues with food security, job security, you know, connection and connectivity security, all those things that they don't have. Mm -hmm. And that most people don't think of the United States that way, that oh, you're a wealthy country, everyone lives well. It's just not true. Wow. And it's, it's sad because it's gotten worse in the last 20 years. And probably even more so since the COVID hit, right? Because yeah, I mean, COVID, so many businesses COVID, were out and people lost jobs yeah. and all things. Yeah, and it's, I mean, you, you'd mm. think it's like that would be the great, great equalizer. Mm -mm. You know, you've got an illness, everyone can get it. But that's not true because it's not the great equalizer. All it does is show where the issues are. Yes. You know, you've got communities which don't have access to health care. They don't have the communication tools. They don't have um, the emergency services. They don't have the ability to get vaccines as easily as other populations. So it really is not an equalizer at all. It's really showing kind of really the systemic issues that exist in the U.S. Yeah. Wow. That is, it's, that? It's, it's quite, it's quite intriguing to hear this from you because I mean, I've been interviewing people for a long time and I've never heard anybody talk about the poverty, actual things. Like, you know, there's something, but I didn't realize it was that bad. Um, and it, it's, it, it's, it's incredible. And, it, and the, as if someone has lived in the United States my entire life, I mean, yeah. I don't even, I'm not saying I don't think about it. I'm not as aware of it as I've become from this business because you just don't see it. I mean, you're yeah. until you've lived and you've served this community and you see the extent of the poverty, it's kind of shocking because in the United States, nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to be like, I live in the US and I'm poor or I'm underserved or I'm in some way not doing as well as someone else mm -hmm. because so much importance in this country in particular is placed on, you know, how much money you have and how well you're doing. And, you know, how, and it is a big, I mean, it's the truth that in the United States people, that's where their focus is. And so nobody mm -hmm. wants to talk about people who are poor. Nobody wants to talk about people who don't have enough food. That's not something people want to talk about. And your, your listeners are like, wow, you're bumming me out. But um, it's, it's just a truth of the United States that, that mm -hmm. is, you know, I think, amazing through this company. I've gotten to really witness it, whether it's food banks where we service people or um, other other parts of the communities that are reaching those people who are really, you know, having issues day to day. Um, I think it's been an amazing educational experience for me. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, I'm I'm quite impressed with with the level of depth that you're going into researching your market. That's going deep, deep into the. You're like <laughs> my consumers want something a little lighter, but. <laughs> do you find that your avatar clarity because you are very tuned into it do you feel like that has really helped you to service your clients on this level that you're doing it now because how long is true connect now going for uh we've been in business now for i mean the company existed before my brother and i acquired it but since you guys years. since since I mean, you since guys we have... over, since we took it over it has been 13 years okay 
So it like, do you find like every year you dive deeper and deeper to understanding your customers? Do that change at all? It's amazing. It's, it's not an easy consumer to truly understand because I mean, some of our customers are transient. Some of them are back and forth to Mexico and the U S yeah. some of them are throughout the Midwest, the United States and are moving state to state depending on employment. So, I mean, it is, it is a very hard customer to know, uh, to truly know because you can know generalities about them. I will say social media is amazing in that way because we've learned more about our customers through social media than anything uh, because with the ads we target and use to try to reach these customers, that's only really the only effective way we've found to learn more about who this consumer is and how we reach them mm -hmm. other than just, okay, you're at this kind of income level and so you qualify for the service, mm -hmm. you know, knowing kind of, you know, what is their origin, what's their background, do they have family? Are they, you know, first generation, second generation? You really don't understand the customer at that level until you've really started trying to target them as a consumer. Mm. Uh, and social media has been actually an amazing way to really learn more about this consumer. Yeah. So think something positive about social media there, because like everyone just says negative stuff about it. But you know, Facebook and Google and these other platforms, they they have a a real value to a company like us in terms of their ability to help us reach that consumer. Mm -hmm. So maybe one of them will hear this and they'll call me and say, we want to give you free ads on our, <laughs> on our platform. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> um, so we, we talked about struggles just before we push record. And um, obviously there, every company has struggles. If you don't have struggles, you don't, you know, have a proper company. That's in my opinion anyway. What has been one single biggest problem that you guys faced in the last few years? One biggest problem. I would say, I mean, I think the thing I've struggled with the most, this is me personally, I think my brother would echo this, is hiring the right executives. Okay. It is really hard. I mean, it mm. is it is really hard to replicate. I mean, this is going to sound weird, but to replicate yourself. I know I have a twin brother, but you know, it's that's only hard. two of us, but it's really hard to find. And I, I know my weakness. Mm -hmm. If I have a blind spot, it's hiring people. I tend, to, I tend to interview people. I like them. I like their passion and maybe they can't do the job, but then I hire them and they can't do the job. And I'm like, all right, like, what am I doing? Like I'm hiring another person who's not capable of doing his job. Yeah. And so what I've done now is I've actually put someone between me and hiring and I ask her, she does the first screening because she's very good at hiring. And I'm like, you, I will not talk to anyone until you talk to them first good and you idea. tell me explicitly, this is a good person. <laughs> and then I interview them. I'm like, all right, I'm, I don't care about liking them. Let me just focus on, is this yes. someone who can really do the job? <laughs> but I, I think that, that for me and my brother, I think we would both agree that's a huge blind spot. And I think for a lot of entrepreneurs, it's really, really hard to hire good people. And I think when I see companies that are good at it, I am envious beyond belief because I've met companies, I've been in companies where I see, God, everyone here is so good at what they do. And it's like so annoying because you're like, how do I replicate that, that kind of DNA? Because it's not easy. They're really not easy. There's a trick to it. I actually interviewed a guy called Matan Kavish, and he's a he's the CEO and founder of a company called um, Fit Heat, which is big in America. I don't know if yeah. you know it, know it. And um, he has a rock star team. So he told his story on you know my my podcast. I think it was like three or four episodes ago. And um, COVID hit his business hard, and he had to shut his doors. And they had multiple branches all across New York. So basically, his business failed like completely. And um, his team helped him to build up his business and they made multiple figures in less than a year and build everything back up again. Um, wow. And he actually, I interviewed him on basically, how do you create a rock star team? But there's a system yeah. in that. Um, and afterwards we can have a chat on I gotta that. Listen to that podcast I got to go back and find that in your files. I'm going to listen to that. <laughs> I will admit that it's definitely not been my strength. So and yeah. I think that's been always been a challenge but once you start and i said it's not true now because i don't want my current team to listen to this and be like what are you talking about like <laughs> are you talking about me but now my, it took a while for us to get to the current team we have who has yes. really performed exceptionally well and uh each person i have does just an exceptional job 
at what I do. My weakness, I think, is really in the earlier process of bringing people on, I relied too much on just, oh, I'm, I've done everything. I know how to do everything. I'm good at hiring people. Mm. And then example after example would happen where I'm like, I really am not good at this. <laughs> so. Oh my goodness, I completely relate. Okay, so I've interviewed people a lot on the show and every time I like to dive into a little bit of routine. You know, what do you do on a daily basis? And one thing I have discovered is that, and that's why this is called Unleash Your Focus podcast, because really diving in to see what makes people focus, understanding behind the scenes what makes them successful. And one thing that I have really dialed in is a routine, whether it's a morning routine or evening routine, but there's some sort of a routine that successful people follow where I can almost say no success, non-successful people don't have. Do you have a structure or a routine every day that you follow? <laughs> I should, have my, I should have my wife answer this question. <laughs> <laughs> this dude's maniacal about his, about his schedule. Um, no, I'm, I'm very, very disciplined. Like I, I, if I can think about one thing about myself that I appreciate about myself, and maybe this is DNA, maybe it's upbringing, I don't know. Uh, but I've always been really disciplined. So I get up every day at 5 or 6 a.m. I work out for an hour. I do that before I go to work. I have my routine before I have my one cup of coffee. I read you know, articles, whatever I have you, before I go to work. I'll have my routine of like how much time do I have to take a shower and then get dressed and then get to one of my offices. And so I'm very, my wife, she kind of laughs about it. I'm very, very regimented, not because I feel like I need to be, it's just who I am. Yeah. And so I, whoops, one second. <laughs> Is you there? Back on. But that's, there we go, back on. But uh, I, I just find myself that that's kind of the way I'm built, where I feel like I need that kind of discipline to mm-hmm. have structure in my day. And it's, I, I think it's been one of the keys of success for me and my brothers. Mm-hmm. We're both very much the same way. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't like wasting time. I don't, I'm incredibly impatient. I'm not going to say I don't have a temper because I think that kind of comes with it. <laughs> but uh, I think I think people who are kind of driven feel a need to like do stuff, and so I think yeah. um, maybe part of that discipline is the the driven part of me, uh, because even though I'm not 20, um, I'm still very very driven in terms of what we do and how we do it, and I want to build a bigger company and I want it to be successful, mm-hmm. and I want to have multiple businesses, and so I, my brother and I have set out to do that, and. Now, so far, so good. It hasn't been easy. At times, I've been like, all right, I, I'm not sure about this company. But right now, I mean, even though COVID-19 has hit us, we've been blessed with all the companies are performing very, very well, yeah. despite COVID-19. So none of them were restaurants. Thank God. That's a good thing, especially Otherwise, in restaurants yeah. today. Yeah. It's rough. Yes, very rough. Um, we have a, we had a few, well, we know of a few restaurants here in New Zealand that closed down, which is like a drop in the bucket in comparison to what's happening in the States. Because it's right. not a lot of places that doesn't even, they're not even allowing restaurants to be open, right? Depending on the state uh, that you're in. No, uh, they are now. I mean, the difference is New Zealand actually handled the pandemic where the US kind of pretend like it didn't exist. Like, well, let's just pretend it doesn't exist and it'll true, go away. True, but uh, also... <laughs> All of New Zealand, there's like four and a half, maybe five million people in know, all of New Zealand. Can, so you can use, you can use New Zealand as one state in the U.S. and it would still apply. So <laughs> True. maybe you guys a compliment. At least you Thank took you. it seriously. You got it addressed. Mm. The U.S. different states did different things. It was a mess. Um, I think things have gotten a little bit better, and it's still a long way to go for us. But I think there's been a little bit of a resignation of all right, let's just open all the restaurants because at this point, who cares? I think that's kind of what I'm seeing is California last week out of nowhere was just like, all restaurants can open. And I think that's in part because I, my personal opinion is the governor is facing a recall now mm-hmm. because people are so angry at him that he's like, all right, I've got to do something. I'm just going to open all the restaurants and hopefully the recall will go away and they won't have they won't throw me out of the governorship. So it, it tends to be, overly political versus what's the best way to do this it's it's hard to look at this 2020 because you're trying to to figure out what was the right way to do this Mm -hmm. shutting everything else everything down the right thing to do Mm -hmm. is opening up graduate the right thing to do i mean 
I, I think looking back on this, we'll come up with a formula of like, God forbid this were to happen again. This is probably the right way to do it because mm. I agree shutting down everything didn't make sense. It, it mm. just, it didn't stop the virus. I mean, no. people will say, well, if we shut down everything we would have stopped it. But I mean, is that really real, uh, a real practical reality in the world we live in to be able to do that? You can shut down flights, I get that part, but like, can you shut down in every single independent business in the United States? You just can't do it. Mm -mm. It's impossible. Yeah. So I, I think, I hope we learn from this and, you know, learn a better way that if there's a issue like this in the future, yeah. how to better handle it and really think much more logically over, over you know, over time of, of ways to roll out uh, an effort to combat the um, the virus versus just saying, let's shut everything down. Yeah. Of course, wearing masks helps. I mean, when you're saying don't wear a mask, I mean, that's not that's not that big a deal to ask people to wear a mask, but <laughs> I won't get political on the show. But I don't see, you know, I, I can understand that masks obviously make a difference, but you still touch things, right? So You do. I mean, it's... It's it's a hard thing to kind of really figure out what's the best way to handle it. And exactly. I mean, I'm I'm in a unique position of my dad was actually a virologist, so Ooh, I grew cool. up I grew up listening to this throughout my childhood, and that's part of the reason I got to live in all the countries I got to live in. Um, so I I probably know more about viruses than the average person. So like I would just think about how if you were alive, how he would have reacted to how we handled this in the United States. And uh, he would not have been happy because there were just some very simple things that we could have done that didn't involve shutting everything down that we didn't do. Yes. And it just, I think it was, uh, I think it really boiled down to politics, which is, you know, That's unfortunate. It. Yes. Because I think people died unnecessarily as a result of that. Yes. Yes, so. definitely. Um, yeah, I completely agree with that statement. So, um, before we get to the end of this, um, I have a question for you, which I always ask on the episode, every episode. A lot of the people listening to this are people that want to start a business or they're sitting on the fence or they have started a business, but, they, but they're stuck. They're just not getting you know, to that next point in their business. What advice do you have for somebody that is stuck? Okay. Well, I think there's two pieces of advice I would share from my own personal experience. I think are true for any entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. There's two things. Number one is, that I wish I'd learned sooner. Number one is that you've got to know when to quit. It's one thing to be stubborn and bullheaded and think you're right, but there, there comes a point where you need to really realize like this isn't working and I need to do something different or just end this business and you know, start another business. Yeah. There's no, no shame in shutting a business down and doing something totally different. I've done it. And some of the best experiences I had, honestly, was walking away, being like, this isn't going to work. I'm done killing myself trying to make this work. I'm going to move on. Yes. So that would be my first piece of advice. People probably be like, that's the worst advice I've ever heard. I love that, uh, actually. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the second piece of advice I would, I would provide would be, which is going to sound polar opposite, but it really isn't, is that you, you have to, I mean, every entrepreneur is is crazy in their dedication to being successful and you have to never give up and that sounds trite and kind of cliche but the never give up aspect isn't about never giving up on the same business mm -hmm. it's never giving up that ultimately that if you have that drive you have the energy that ultimately you will be successful maybe it won't be you know doing books online probably a bad example mm -hmm. um maybe maybe it won't be you know, starting an eBay store online, maybe it won't be that, but it will be something. And I think if, as long as you leave yourself open to the idea that maybe this didn't work, now I'm going to shift to this and do something different. Yeah. Um, I think it's probably a little bit counter to what a lot of entrepreneurs say, because a lot of successful entrepreneurs, honestly, especially younger ones, they were successful the first thing they did. That's true. I'm not one of the people. I, I was not successful for the very first business I got involved in. And my brother and I had numerous businesses because we didn't always focus on one that didn't work out um some were startups some were later stage yeah uh, we've been fortunate that we've been able to move and reposition in fact the company i spent most of my time talking about on your show true connect mm -hmm. i mean we were very close to bankruptcy twice 
-hmm. And I think that's what gets to the point of knowing when to give up, but also knowing when to persevere and really press on because you know ultimately you'll be successful. That's yes. a hard thing to know when that when that switch switch for the flip of like, do I keep going or do I stop? Yes. And I don't know that I have a, a, a secret formula to that, but I think you you know when you know because you'll get to a point where like I've tried everything and like I need to just walk away. And sometimes that means you know firing people. It means accepting that you've lost the money you've put into the business mm -hmm. it means you've, uh, you know oh my god now i gotta start all over again i've got to start from scratch and that i mean that sucks because you feel kind of like a failure you feel yes. like oh, exactly it's a hard pill to swallow mm -hmm. um i've swallowed that pill several times i can tell you if you swallow it more than once it's easy um <laughs> because then you learn all right this happened before i moved on i started something else it'll yes. work out and I can guarantee you nine out of 10 times it, it ultimately work out if you have the ability to be resilient with failure mm -hmm. and be committed to, I think, ultimately achieving success, whatever that looks like to each person, it's different. For me, I have an idea of what that looks like. I don't know. I don't think I'm there yet. Uh, I think my brother and I are both very driven on uh, really liking and, and wanting to be involved in multiple companies at once mm -hmm. versus just one. And I think that's a different kind of mindset than some other people have. Yeah. But I think that allows us to kind of shift focus very easily. So like, let's focus on this business or let's focus on this one, let's focus on this one and be able to drive multiple businesses at once is what really gets us excited. But I, I think those two things would be, I think, the key for me of, of for certain entrepreneurs who may listen to this might be helpful to them of, of really knowing all right I, I need to persevere i need to be committed and i need to never give up at the same time there is a point where you should just be like you know this isn't working yeah and i've got to end this and do something different mm. yes and that's a, that's a scary thing to face um but it's true it's very it's true. very true and yeah. and i've seen people firsthand and i was there myself for about a year where i was doing something and i was miserable but i had this thing i yeah. want to keep doing it i'm going to keep trying i'm going to make this a success and eventually like oh, just just stop just you know just don't do yeah. it and yeah and now what i do is awesome because i did stop and i redid everything so right. now, now, now look at yourself now you're doing something you love doing exactly. and you're enjoying it and that only happened because you stopped doing the other thing so well, there you go there you it go. does it does it does open that cliche of opening other doors it's definitely true though exactly because, i mean with this business even though i knew so, twice i seriously thought about it, maybe maybe i should move on from this i think at the end of the day like i knew in my gut like there is something more here mm -hmm. i i know it i have an intuition that there's something there and i think when that happens you'll know that that's happening and you'll keep going yes it's just hit that that slate wall where there's there's exactly. no beyond that wall you need to be like all right i'm done i'm gonna move on that's great <laughs> advice that's really awesome advice matthew thank you so much even if we had a rocky thing in between with technology and stuff um it has been fantastic and thank you for your patience on that as well and thank you for sharing your golden nuggets the audience is going to love this it's absolutely amazing. Where can people reach you if they want to be part of True Connect in any way or help you? What can they do to help you and what can you do for them and where can they reach you? Uh, I mean, you can, oh, I'm happy to respond to anyone who wants to ask questions over to it, at my email, which is you know, mjohnson at trueconnect.com. Um, that's, I'm always on email, like most entrepreneurs. So um, I can't guarantee I'll answer every question, but if <laughs> someone has a question I can answer that kind of is helpful, um, I'm happy to do so. Uh, I think these types of shows, and I, I listen to things like this, kind of hearing different commentary from different entrepreneurs. Some of it, for some people, won't be as helpful. For others, they may be that little piece okay. of information. You're like, yeah, but I, I need to listen to that because that's what I should be doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I hope this has been helpful. Enjoy. It's a pleasure to be on the yeah. show. Really nice meeting you. Thank you so much. And very nice meeting you as well. And we will drop uh, the links below and then you guys can also reach out to Matthew. Thank you so much, much, Matthew. You must have a fantastic rest of your afternoon. Okay, same to you. Thank you so much. Cheers. Bye-bye.